for a cloud provider. And I was working on the network. And I remember it was at night. And I was doing a deployment. And everything was great. Uh, I was at my home. Yeah, but I will say it was a, a good night. And I remember that suddenly I saw red. <laughs> and as you may imagine, when you see red, it's because something goes wrong. And at that moment, I remember the feeling that what is happening. I was looking at the screen. I was able to see the error, right? But I remember the feeling that I was not able to comprehend why another system was blocking my deployment if, I don't know, it was related to my, to my change or was another thing. I freak out, to be honest. And I remember that the worst thing was that there was nobody available. It was at that time in the morning that the people in the US were still sleeping and the people in Europe were still sleeping or they were uh, about to wake up. But yeah, I was alone. So it was not really a, a good experience that I had that night. And let me tell you uh, again another story that this happened a few years ago and I was already at Cisco and we were doing a change in a network and if you're familiar, we have on network devices interfaces. And we shut down the interface because it was par. And when we shut down the interface, we lost the device. It turns out that the management was through the interface and we lost the device. <laughs> and, the, and the bad thing is that the device was in South Africa and we were in Mexico. So you can imagine I, I was not able to go to the device, okay, turn on the interface. But at that time, I was not alone. I had a team of uh, engineers with me. We were able to brainstorm. We were able to figure out, hey, if you turn on the interface on another remote device, there's a layer two connection that will allow us to recover the device. And we did that. And we recovered the device. The customer never realized that we had that issue. And we were quite happy and we progressed. Now, what I'm telling you these stories is because on one occasion, I was alone. I had an issue, and I struggled a lot. Yeah, eventually I fixed that part, but uh, it was painful. And in the other occasion, I was not alone. I was able to ask all other engineers, OK, what can we do? And we brainstorm. So when the AI part started to become popular, I realized, hey, if I have someone who can tell me what the issue could be, that will be super helpful. At least give me a clue of what is happening. So that's why uh, today I'm going to show you a proof of concept of how AI can help you to troubleshoot that network issue. Now, before we st I start, I'm just curious. How many people here are application developers? OK. How many are infrastructure developers? OK, how many uh, deal with the network? OK, we have 50-50. OK, I, I just want to make sure the talk is appropriate for worth, both wars, and I can give you the best. So the agenda that I have prepared for today is quite simple. So I will go through how I was able to design this solution. I consider that this is the part that is useful for developers as well. Then, if we don't have issues with the network, I'm going to be able to show you a demo, a real demo. Otherwise, I will have to go with a video. And finally, a uh, wrap up. So let's start with designing the system. And in this case, when I was working uh, with this idea, the main challenges that I had was, OK, how can I send the data to the AI? And also, how can the AI access my data, in this case, my network devices? And that was the thing, OK, how can I build a system based on these challenges? Um, to start, I had to think, OK, how can the network share data with the AI? And in this case, if you are not familiar with network devices, we have several ways to interact with, uh, net with the devices. We have traditional methods, which I can tell you are for persons, are not really on a structured data. So when you want to automate something, it's painful. And I highly recommend don't go that way, unless you have to. But we also have native programmable interfaces on the network devices now. For example, NetConf, RESTConf, and GNMI. 
And by the name, you can assume RESTConf is based on the REST uh, specification. And GNMI is based on gRPC, so it's better, it's highly performance. But in this, in this POC, I had some limitations. So yeah, you need to, to figure out, OK, what devices you have, and if the device supports what features. In this case, I had to use NetConf, because that was what the devices were able to support. Then once I'm extracting the data from the network devices, I need to work with the data, right? I don't want to send everything to the LLM. I just want to send to the LLM the relevant parts, right? And in this case, I was thinking, OK, I need some observability solution. And the best way you, know, you already know that part is to go to the CNCF, check the landscape, and see what it is available, check your requirements. You, you may already already have this part. But in my case, for example, my main requirements were NetConf, because that was what my devices supported, right? And they should be reacting to metrics. And for me, this is the, the key part. And this is where I came from, where the solution that I had. I'm using the tick stack. Basically, I can use Telegraph. Even though there's no direct um, connection between Telegraph and Netcom for my devices, Telegraph has a Python plugin, so I can execute a Python script. And basically, I was able to put a Python script that is collecting the Netconf data from the devices. I'm using InfluxDB as a, my time series database. But Grafana, that's the thing that for me is important, because Grafana is able to, OK, show me the data, but at the same time, I can define alerts. And that's the key part for me. When, so, when there is a condition happening in the network, and the condition is met, please send me that uh, alert. And in this case, it supports webhook. So for me, that was like the key point. OK, I can send something programmatically to the AI. The next part is to pick an LLM. And it may sound trivial, but it's also not that an, an easy choice. I usually get lost with so many flavors that we have day after day. So I found that this page uh, is quite useful to show me several models. There are many comparisons in that page, but for example, in this case, quality versus context windows and input token price is something that I consider is good. So yeah, just for your information, um, I consider the, the page to be quite good. Then I want to interact with the AI programmatically, right? Uh, I'm receiving the webhook, and I want to interact with it uh, doing something. I don't want to interact manually or as a human. And we have a lot of developer frameworks. Uh, in this case, I'm just putting some. And if you go to the report of Sequoia, you will find many more. There are so many. In my case, and you may already know, based on the title of the session, I choose LangChain because it's based on Python. Actually, let me show you this. It's based on Python. It has some nice abstractions that, for me, this is key. I don't want to put everything. Um, it's uh, LLM agnostic. So if, late, if I started with OpenAI and later I want to use Mistral or Gemini, it should be quite easy to move. And if there is a problem, we already know that there's a community around where I can just open an issue and ask for some help. I usually, that's the way I work and I find my way around. In this case, LangChain has a lot of stuff. You can see, for example, we have uh, the core part, templates, LandServe, LandSmith. But what it matters to me are the chains and agents. And this is when, when I was looking around and I saw, OK, what is a chain? What is a, an agent? This was golden. Because basically, the, the change is a sequence of actions, but it is hard coded. I need to tell if, B hap if A happens, do B, and then do C. And to be honest with you, I wasn't interested on that part. Uh, I was a bit lazy, so I was thinking, why don't let the AI to decide the best way to, to do something, right? to resolve the issue? I don't want to, to go and any time, OK, if there's a new issue in the network, 
you, I need to go to my code, do a change on the code to tell now you need to do this part. I prefer if the AI is able to, to decide by itself. And that's the reason why I went with agents. Now, on LangChain, there's something, a concept called tools. How many are familiar with the tools? Okay, I see uh, qu quite many. Something that, I, for those of you who are not familiar with tools, basically is a way to provide to the LLM a function in Python. And this is the key part where I can start mixing things or linking things. Because if I have a, a function available, then I can create a function that uses an API that does an API call to some resource. And this is the, the part that I consider super, super important. But if you see, there are several parts on, on this tool that are important. First, I have a, be, a very strict de descriptive name. And this is quite important for the LLM. It needs to understand what it can do with that tool. And I found that um, it was a bit tricky. I have to be very, very specific. Otherwise, you get some results that were strange. If, if you also see in this pair in the dot string, I'm highlighting that part. Because uh, this is why also you, you need some sort of background. In my case, as a network engineer, I know, OK, if I'm giving you this tool, and I'm noticing that the tool actually will give you the current information, but not what is missing. So that's why, based on your experience, you, you need to tell the, the, the LLM, OK, this function will do this, but will not consider, in this case, for example, the neighbors that are not included. And lastly, something that I also like, and you can see, is that, OK, I'm not defining really, really the logic there for Python. Um, that's abstracted. So in my case, for example, I can reuse this function to do something else, to, to use it in another framework. And that's something that I really like it with the tools on uh, LangChain. And again, we need to interact with the network, right? We need our tools to interact with the network from the LLM. And we still have our options. Like I tell you, I will not recommend to go with the traditional, you have the native programmable interfaces. But pretty soon, when I was doing my exercise, I realized that if I started to go with the programmable interfaces, it will be too much work. Behind the scenes, the interfaces uses a data model language called Jang, which is quite good for working with structured data. The painful part is to go and extract the portion that you want from the Jang model. It, it, yeah, it's not that user friendly. So when I started to do that part, I quickly realized that uh, it should be a better way to interact with the network, right? And I should be able to go on that way. So that's why, OK, I thought, why not use a framework that already exists, that can do what I'm looking for? In this case, uh, this is not a complete list. It's just some examples that I had in mind when I was doing this. You can use open source framework like uh, Batfish, Nalpal, Norning that they already provide that uh, functionality. You also have Ansible if you are using, and that's why you can do the connection between your Python uh, tools to Ansible in this case. At Cisco, there is also one framework that um, is open to use, but it's not open source, I would say, because the core is not open. It's called PyATS. Uh, and when I saw PyTS, I thought, yeah, this could be like the best one for me, because I don't want to. I don't want to handle w with uh, the connection to the devices, with how I retrieve the data. I just want to work with the data. So, as you can see, those were the phases when I was working on on this solution on how I can interact with the devices. The next part that I would like to show you is. OK, how this thing looks like in real life, if this thing works or, or not. Be, um, for the demo, I have a very simple topology. Um, I just wanted to check, OK, if AI is able to resolve this part. I have three devices. 
they are connected between them. I have a routing protocol. For those of you who don't know what a routing protocol is, basically the devices need to agree that uh, they are alive. and They can exchange information on how to reach somewhere. Uh, otherwise, if they don't have this information, they will not be used for the traffic. Uh, that's basically how everything works underneath. And basically, I define an uh, alarm. And the alarm is, if the average uh, number of neighbors in 30 seconds is less than the average number of neighbors in 30 minutes, then send an alarm that ISIS is down. Uh, this allows me to have n number of neighbors, so that I consider, yeah, this, this, this is a good example. Um, and now, I want to explain to you the flow, and I consider this is important so you can understand what is happening on the demo. You can see I have several uh, parts in this case. I have my network devices, my observability solution. I didn't comment, but I'm using FastAPI. That's where I put LangChain, and that's where I do the connection. Uh, I have also PyATS. I'm also using WebEx. That's an instant messaging application that we have at Cisco. And I use it because it was easy for me to use. But basically, uh, I'm interactive via REST APIs. So any front end uh, application that uses uh, REST APIs can work on it. Um, to start, so the, uh, the observability is checking my network devices. When, the, when the, the condition is met, I receive an alert. An alert is triggered from the observability to WebEx to me, so I, I need to know something happened, right? But this also sends the alert to FastAPI. FastAPI then calls LangChain, LangChain calls my agent, and basically it starts some interaction in this case uh, between my agent, LangChain, and PyATS. And then PyATS goes to my network devices and start retrieving information about the issue. And this is the part where I can see, okay, the AI is troubleshooting. Finally, once the AI finishes, it will send me the information to WebEx, and I can interact with it. So let's, let's go to the demo. I hope it is big enough, and you can see the, the word. Okay, perfect. So I don't remember if I, for, if I commented, but uh, the code that I'm using is available. Uh, you can run this example by your own. And this make command is really a wrapper about around uh, Docker Compose, so I don't have to type everything. So now my server started. And now let me go to, like I commented, this is my topology. I have access, so yeah, I need to type some commands. It is, I know that this is old for some people, but yeah, this is the way it is on networking. So you can see I have interfaces up. So do show ISI. I have my ISI's neighbors up. Um, what I'm going to do is to shut down this interface, interface gigabit phi, to, to break ISI's. I know that you already know the issue, but suppose this is happening and you, uh, on your network. So let me go interface gigabit 5.5. Five. Uh, before that, OK, I can, this is Grafana that is currently monitoring. Everything is good. So let's shut down. I shut down the interface, and I should be able to see that here on Grafana pretty soon. Finger crossed that this works. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I was starting to get nervous. But uh, as you can see, um, basically Grafana detect that my ISIS neighbor count is less than it was previously. So it's triggering an alert in this case. Let's see if I already received a notification, and I did. This is a notification, and pretty simple. And this is what is sent to the AI, to LLM, uh, basically saying, 
on this device, a neighbor is down. And that's it. That's all the information that I'm telling the AI. It's up to the AI to figure it out what is happening. Now, let me scroll down a bit. And basically, here the AI, in this case, I'm using OpenAI. Um, after some testing, I figured out it was the LLM that is able to utilize better the tools that I provided. And in this case, for example, it's receiving an alert. And it's saying, OK, I have a neighbor down. And it's starting to create a plan. And the first thing is reviewing, OK, the devices, if the devices already exist, because it was hallucinating at this point. And the first thing that I had to share with the AI was, no, the first thing you need to do is to verify if the resources that I have described actually exist. And don't invent anything, because he was inventing the, the devices. And in this case, after that, is verifying ISIS. This is a tool on PyATS that I developed. Is reviewing, in this case, uh, for example, the devices. This is the uh, ISIS configuration, in this case. Um, I believe this is the part. Yeah. Yeah, this is the logs. Um, and this is something that actually, if you know how to troubleshoot an issue, you know where the places to look for, right? And that's something that I consider it was useful to share with uh, the LLM on the prompt. On the prompt, I have to define the steps and how it should troubleshoot. And that's where your experience really is important. So you need to tell, OK, if there's something happening, do these kind of steps. Otherwise, it was creating some sort of loop. Uh, and it was not finishing, only it was giving me wrong information. OK, just to not go too long, as you can see, it's doing a lot of steps in this part, reviewing. And at the end, it's giving me a summary of what happened. Uh, it can tell me the devices. In this case, for example, was able to figure out it was shut down, the interface. And it is giving me the, the action items. As you can see, it didn't share with me all the troubleshoot it did. It's only giving me the information that is more relevant. So for now, let's say yeah, if I want to bring the interface, and I will say, yes, please, the service back. OK. Um, and also, another thing that I learned was that by itself, it was trying to do the change with all my confirmation. And it depends on you if in, the, in your production environment you want AI to do this automatically, probably not. In LandChain, there is a method for you to specify that this is, has to be approved by a human. In my case, I put it on my prompt, and that's how it's working. So let's see what answer. Um, it doesn't show the interface. Um, and let's see if it verifies. It seems like it didn't verify, so I need to ask that part. <coughs> Can you check ISIS? But if I go, uh, it seems like. OK, let me see. <coughs> OK, I'm not sure if actually on shot the interface in this case. Uh, so let's, let's do a quick verification to show IP interface brief. And it's still shut down. I don't know why it did fail. So I will try again, and let's see. And you bring back the interface. I can tell you in the if you go to the repository that I'm sharing on the slides and you see the demo that I recorded, actually at that time the the LLM on showed the interface without issues and then it reviewed the device. In this case, I'm not sure if yeah, 
in this case, it is actually not doing what I want. So that's another part that probably you need to consider. Uh, it not always do what you want, especially in this live demo. But again, if you go to the recording, you can see how it was working fine at that time. So given the time that we have, I will go back to the presentation. Um, basically, the wrap up. Something that I would like to share when I was doing this experiment, and probably can save you some time, is that the hands-on experience matter. Like I commented, you need to know how to troubleshoot an issue so you can share with the LLM. It's important. If you don't know, yeah, probably you will not get so far. Got the AI like a junior engineer. Uh, I, when I was doing the prompt and I was providing the tools, sometimes the AI got confused about what tools to use and the meaning. So I felt like I was talking to a junior engineer and explaining very detailed when this happens, do this, when that happens, do that. The good thing is that this is on the code. So once it's there, I mean, I don't have to modify it uh, anymore. The function names and doc strings are super important. I remember that in a function, if I didn't specify that this was for a single interface, it was not able to recognize between interface and interfaces. So I realized that it is important to put something like a single in my case. And I noticed that as when I was putting better information on the doc strings, yeah, it was behaving better. And a tip is you can use something like GitHub Copilot to do this part. And for me, it was super useful. Agents. Right now, I only use one agent. But you know that right now, you can use multiple agents, for example, with land graph. I would expect the hallucinations will be less if you have one LLM that will only do troubleshooting for, I don't know, layer one, another LLM for ISIS, another LLM for BGP. Or if you are working more on the application or the infrastructure side, one LLM for um, networking, one LLM for Terraform, etc. So if you divide, I consider it will be easier. And then rise and repeat. It took me a while just to get to get the LLM to do what I wanted. Even though it fell or it wasn't the result I wanted today, um, it took a while just for the LLM to behave in this way and react and find what I wanted. So yeah, it will just be a matter of try uh, and repeat. Having said that, as a next step, if you are curious, I'm sharing everything that I did um, on the on developer.cisco.com on Sandbox. We offer free resources, so <laughs> you can reserve what Sandbox and basically use my code there, and it will not cost you anything. But yeah, I didn't show you the prompt, and the prompt was quite big. So take the time uh, if you go and take a look at the prompt. Uh, just to see, okay, how detailed I have to go uh, to tell the AI. And how is that? I think we have two minutes for questions. Any questions, comments? Yeah. Uh, thanks, very interesting. Uh, so, w w what is the future of it? Was it your lunchtime project and uh, now you just leave it there, or, or is it on a Cisco roadmap to? Make it bigger and better? Yeah, this was more an experimentation for developers. On Cisco, there are official products now that are starting to use AI, where you have an assistant, and the assistant can do this part uh, of troubleshooting. But those are products for enterprises, paid products. In my case, I just wanted to show you how you can interact, how you can use AI for troubleshooting. In my case, I'm not doing any rack. It was just the AI interacted with my devices. Yeah. yeah. Have you found somewhere some uh, LLM models dedicated to BGP or other protocols? An LLM that is already Prepared. specialized? Yeah, or some data sources we can use to refine a model? No, I haven't. I, I, I haven't found anything in LLM, but there was a talk today here on this room about uh, Instruct Lab from Red Hat and IBM. And I thought it was quite interesting if we can start to do some collaboration with them to have a network in a specialized LLM. Yeah, yeah. 
Okay, if there are no more questions, and I believe we are out of time, thank you so much for your attention, and yeah, thank you.